thank you again for joining us uh, at another extremely interesting panel on uh, navigating through industry transformation. We have with us uh, uh, leaders from the German ship owning, from the German maritime community. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, Knut uh, Erbeck Nielsen for uh, the partnership of DNVGL uh, in putting together this forum. Uh, I would like to welcome you all. I will uh, let Knut introduce you. Special thanks to Constantine Back and Christoph Toffler for their help uh, with uh, the panel and the forum overall. And Knut, uh, the floor is yours again. Tremendous thanks. Um, so far, the day has uh, surpassed any expectation we had in terms of quality and attendance and vibrancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. And uh, I'm really happy to learn that we have such a great attendance. And uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As you will already have heard, maybe from my welcome remarks earlier, my name is Knut Obik Nielsen. I'm the CEO of DNVGL Maritime, and I'm very happy to be your host today. Our panel will today, today lend their collective expertise to the topic of navigating through industry transformation, the German ship owner's viewpoint. Uh, but before we get started, let me quickly introduce you to what I believe is a top class lineup of speakers. So we have with us Mr. Nicholas Bonnemann, the CEO of Atlantic Lloyd, Dr. Johan Killinger, managing partner of Bus Group, Mr. Lucius Bank, founder and managing partner of Auerbach Schifffahrt, Mr. Christoph Topfer, founder and CEO Borealis Maritime, Mr. Konstantin Bach, CEO, MPC Containers, and uh, finally, and certainly, Mr. Nicholas Oldendorf, the Managing Director of Red Rhein Nord. So, um, gentlemen, thank you so uh, much for joining us today. It's great to see you. Uh, of course, it's a pity we cannot see each other face to face, but I believe we've all come very digital savvy by now. So this is uh, beginning to feel quite comfortable. Uh, before we embark on our discussions, um, I would like to um, uh, briefly touch on a very important point, and that is the ongoing plight of the seafarers. Ten months into the crew change crisis, and it's, it's heartening to see now that nearly 50 countries have stepped up and afforded key worker recognition to seafarers. And I must say that Singapore is really leading the way also when it comes to vaccinations. But while some countries are stepping up to meet this uh, challenge, many are still not. And I think collectively, we should all increase the pressure on these governments to really step up. Governments across the world also need to prioritize seafarers in the vaccine queue. After all, healthy vaccinated seafarers are the best way to keep supply chains moving and to maintain crew well being and safety at sea. After all, this is in everyone's best interest. But let's now turn our attention to the topic at hand. Uh, Germany is certainly a titan of global shipping. Indeed, Germany is one of the largest seafaring nations in the world. It holds a very special place in my own heart and that of my company. I have had a base in Hamburg since 2014. I can see the river Elbe from my office and hear the foghorns of passing ships. And Hamburg is synonymous with international shipping. Perhaps best known for its container shipping sector, Germany sits on the top rung of the international market with around 30% market share. As a whole, the industry generates an annual turnover of more than 50 billion euros. And all this is the basis of Germany's success as the mobility and logistics world champion. But like the rest of the world, Germany is not immune to the transformative impact of decarbonization, digitalization, unpredictable markets, nor indeed the pandemic. During our conversation today, I really hope that we can tackle some of these issues and breathe some new life into the debate. And so without further delay, uh, let us begin uh, with the first question. 
And for this one, I would like to turn to you, uh, Nico Bonneman, Atlantic Lloyd. Um, in November of last year, the IMO announced plans to introduce an energy efficiency index for existing ships, their so-called EEXI, which will likely enter into force as soon as January 2023. What steps are you taking to future-proof your fleet in anticipation of this? Nico, please. Uh, Knut, first of all, thank you very much for this uh, introduction, uh, especially also on, on highlighting how important still the German cluster is. And I think today we all like to emphasize uh, that this uh, will continue to be uh, the case for Germany. Um, coming back to your question, um, I'm personally very glad that this regulation is coming now, um, as this uh, finally tackles the GHG reduction on the existing fleet on the water. And uh, that is why it's so important to get it right now, um, as it will be our contribution towards carbon utility and gives us a chance to reinvent also our businesses. So the EEXI is uh, basically based on the framework of the EEDI, which has been mandatory for the new buildings uh, after 2013 and uh, should be quite well known. So I won't go too much into detail, but um, as often these regulations, the formula is how to calculate it is known now, but uh, details of how to measure and how to enforce it are still open. And I believe will only be finalized at the next MEPC meeting of the IMO, which is uh, set, I think for June of this year. So in our company, we we have started with assigning one of our technicians to look after this topic. Um, this work has started with calculating the values for the whole fleet to see where each uh, vessel stands. It is not as simple as saying that older vessels uh, score the worst, um, at least from preliminary results, which we uh, ran our fleet. Uh, it shows that some of the older vessels score on top of the list. So. You really need to go from one to one, uh, from vessel to vessel to see uh, where they land in the list. Um, in essence, the EEXI sets limits to the amount of carbon dioxide emitted per cargo ton transported per nautical mile. So basically, to reduce the CO2 emission, uh, one needs to reduce the engine power for the same unit transport. Uh, for those of our vessels, which will be non-compliant, we will be looking at various options such as energy uh, saving devices, engine power limitation, engine derating, energy saving devices, and uh, dead weight increase. And I believe it's widely expected that limiting the engine power and increasing the dead weight are actually the most promising methods to comply and also cut at the least upfront cost. So my personal belief is that most owners will be looking at these two methods with priority. Then in turn, the, it means slower steaming for the non-eco fleet without having the possibility to speed up. So I don't expect too much of a change as anyways, the world fleet has been slow steaming for many years and the refer reference line for the EEXI is based on 2008 emissions uh, when the global vessel speeds were much higher. Having said that, even though modern eco new buildings will be able to comply with speed limitations or without speed limitations, for them, the general topic of what is the future fuel will remain of utmost importance as they will have to trade for 20 or 30 years, uh, when I believe we will have much more stringent rules to comply with towards carbon neutrality than the EXI. Perfect. And uh, I guess having um, slow steaming um, is in some sense ad advantageous uh, for, for the ship owners as, as it reduces the, the capacity of the fleet in a way. Um, may I turn to you, Constantine, and, and maybe hear your views on, on, on what you are doing and whether or not you are, say, more or less following the same uh, trajectory as Nico uh, just um, highlighted, please. Sure, and, and thanks Knut and a warm hello from, from my side as well. Nico has, has obviously already touched on quite a number of aspects. Um, 
let me put that into a bit of a broader perspective as well. I, I believe the forthcoming EXI regulation basically forms part of a larger effort, which is obviously very important, and uh, that is to reduce emissions of our industry in general. And certainly the subject of decarbonization is, is on the top of, of our, our agenda. I will address the EEXI in a minute, but, but would like to start off by emphasizing two aspects. Firstly, I think, and you touched on it as well, uh, further clarity, in my view, on, on the exact implementation and enforcement of the regulation is, is very, very important, in particular as we are a global industry that requires a global framework rather than, let's say, a, a patchwork of, of regional measures, as recently suggested by the EU with regards to the emission trading system. So I think this is a very important aspect uh, accompanying the, the EXI regulation. Secondly, uh, transparency and reporting often undervalued, um, yet essential um, elements in, in my view. And at, at least uh, our end, we place a great emphasis on, on both of these elements in terms of uh, code of conduct, business partner guidelines, uh, CSRS, uh, or also, and most importantly, I think comprehensive sustainability reporting, because only if you're transparent and open and set yourself goals, um, you can basically um, follow on and, and do something that is important next to the pure regulation of things. Now, EEXI is, is obviously one important measure in this respect, which could also prove to be a disruptor. Um, um, as you said, uh, implications on slow steaming, uh, charter party implications, a lot of questions are still uh, open and, and unresolved and will only be answered over time. Um, so as such, in order to remain compliant and competitive, it is, it is important to understand the framework. Um, possible engine power limitations and, and other necessary improvements. So how do we prepare ourselves um, um, in terms of uh, EEXI? We are currently calculating the EEXI values uh, of the existing uh, vessels. And I can kind of just echo some of the points that Nico made in terms of it's not a matter of age. It's, it's really a matter of, of individual line items, individual vessels. Um, so. Uh, we want to, to kind of determine our starting point for, for optimization by, by doing so within our group um, and, and broader group, including uh, Willemsen um, R&Q ship management. Uh, we have a dedicated ship performance team um, already for some years. Um, we have already compiled an extensive database of, of operational data, including fuel consumption, performance, and also energy efficiency measures. And on that basis, I'm very confident that we will be able to upgrade our vessels to the extent necessary and most importantly in time. Um, so, so this is kind of a, a few aspects on EEXI and, and, and furthermore we are obviously and we have started to engage in active dialogue with business partners but also with universities and of course most importantly our customers to strategically develop potential commercially viable solutions um, as we have also done in preparation of IMO 2020 requirements. Um, where we have, for example, agreed on uh, long-term charters against significant investments our side. So I think these are very important ingredients. And since it's the first question, I will, I will close it here um, to allow you to run through other aspects as well. Thanks, Knut. Thank you, Konstantin. And um, my main takeaway from, from both your responses is that uh, you, are, you are quite optimistic about this um, and being able to, to meet this requirement. And, and that is obviously good news. Uh, let us um, move on to, to the next question. And um, maybe here we could have a, a, some temperature and some diverse viewpoints uh, surfacing as well. Uh, you know, all of you, you probably noticed that I have long advocated for the installation of dual fuel LNG engines as being a very robust choice for today, enabling future flexibility for vessels. And uh, I know that many think this is a, a bit too aggressive, uh, you know, advocating uh, gas as a fuel option. Uh, and that leads me to, to the next uh, question. Uh, what fuels or alternative technologies do you envisage the world fleet being propelled by in 2050 and beyond? So it's quite a long view into the future. And, and for this question, if I could start with you, Johan, and, uh, and hear your views, and then, then we'll take it from there, please. Um. Yeah, Eleni, you told me that you cannot demute us. Oh, 
Anyway, that's uh, done. Thank you, Knut, uh, for, for having this wonderful um, conference and in particular this workshop and, and the good preparation. Uh, so I, you gave me some time to think about. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, and there are many answers, probably as many answers to this question as there are people in, in, in the shipping industry. Um, I will also open with some good news. Um, I think the um, IMO, um, uh, the, the, our goals, IMO goals for 2050 will be met. Uh, technology will be in place. And I even expect that we can, we can and probably should Exceed, exceed the 50 percent, um, which is which is a minimum. Um, I think that's that's good news. I'm very optimistic on that. IMO plays a plays an important role. Uh, we all know. Um, however, it will probably take some some time for good reason um, to really start with concrete measures how to how to reach that target. Um, but, um, this is now just avoiding to come to you. Really difficult question. Um, I think there will be diversity in place in 2050, probably like today, probably even more. Um, it's probably a bit easier for short distance shipping um, to, find, to come to a solution. I expect there to be battery powered or electric powered um, ferries and um, short distance ships to be in place, technology is there, batteries can be improved. When I go to Danish islands, I, there's already a ferry completely um, propelled by, 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 by battery. Uh, maybe also fuel cells and maybe also um, um, SNG. For deep sea, I think the answer is a bit more difficult and Hamburg audience is probably more interested in that. Um, um, I don't see batteries there for, 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 for the known reason and also fuel cells. I don't expect that we return to sailing. Um, basically, three fuels are discussed, which is um, synthetic gas, also SNG, ammonia, and uh, hydrogen. Um, I see some advantages for SNG, um, and I give you the reasons. Um, I think um, one main reason is that, or well, one of the reasons is that the infrastructure is in place. You can easily switch um, LNG infrastructure, which I see it's a midterm solution, um, to SNG infrastructure. It's basically it's also gas, um, which uh, more or less everything is the same. So that's an important advantage of, of SNG. The current discussion, there's a lot discussion going on um, in, in particular with, with LNG about methane, um, methane, methane slip. Of course, it is not, not as much valid for, for SNG. However, uh, many people shy away of going to LNG, uh, which is the first step um, before going to SNG because of that. I see that technically solved um, for the um, for the extraction of gas, as well as for the engines. Um, the methane slip issue is gonna be solved with it, I think, in the near future, because there's so much money involved and the interests are high. Um, and um, apart from that, and I also see the, the, um, the supply issue. People say there's not enough carbon, you need the C um, for, for SNG. Also, the, su the supply issue is going to be solved within the next 15, 20 um, years that you have the technology and the logistics uh, to, to put, um, to add, yeah, to put it together, have enough C, um, it took enough carbon in the, in the right place. Ammonia also has a chance. Um, there's no carbon needed, which is definitely, um, it, it's, it's an advantage. And, um, and nitrogen is, is abundant. 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. That's definitely an advantage. However, however um, I, I see lo logistics challenges for ammonia. It's a hazardous good, it's a hazardous substance. And um, I think in, 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 in bunkering in the end for the world shipping fleet, you basically need something which is relatively easy to handle. 
Um, however, there's definitely a chance. Um, hydrogen, um, to come to that at the end, um, I do not see hydrogen as a, as a major fuel um, in deep sea shipping in, in 2050 because of the technical challenges of, of the logistical challenges of hydrogen. It's, it's a very low energy density, so you need huge tanks uh, to transport the necessary hydrogen. Um, of course, you have to handle, you have to, um, you need 250 degrees minus, and it's also very hazardous, it's quite, um, quite explosive. Um, so that's my answer. I think we have a diversity. I see advantages for SNG as a logical uh, successor of LNG. And um, yeah, happy to hear other, <laughs> um, other views. Thank you. Thank you, Johan, and um, thank you also for summarizing at the end. Um, I, I think diversity is is naturally um, uh, definitely on the on the agenda, and uh, and you were quite optimistic about gas. But um, let's turn to Redrai, Nord, and you, Nico, and um, see if you have a different view, or are you basically in in agreement? It would be interesting to to sound out. Please go ahead. Uh, Knut, thank you for having me. Um, you said 2050. I just quickly calculated. I'll be 65 by then, so it's a distant future. And but like you always said, it's it's difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, we've now heard about hydrogen and ammonia. They are all technologies. They have advantages and drawbacks, but they have all one common denominator, which is they are all very much in their infancy stage. So like always, when you ask which technology will prevail, it's quite difficult. But I think we can offer more an abstract. Um, answer to all this, uh, if we go through three points. The first point is, like Yuan already said, we need something which has an energy intensity which is similar to heavy fuel today. I, I don't really see that we have something which is less uh, energy intense because it would mean we need bigger tanks. That would mean we would have to refuel more often and that would actually make the world, again, a bigger space. Globalization had made the world a smaller place. So I think that would be actually a step back. The second, Johanna already also said, very important for us is, of course, uh, the new fuel has to be safe and easy to operate. Shipping people are very highly adaptable, but um, I don't really see um, us driving any nuclear reactors any anytime soon. And like you already said, ammonia is quite hazardous and one incident with ammonia can derail the whole technology. So from a ship owning perspective, I think at least we will stay away from that. And um, the third one, which is most, the most important one, um, is that the fuel has to be globally available and it has to be cheap on a calorific basis. So if we look at all these technologies at the moment, they all don't fit the bill at the moment. But I think there are some quite interesting aspects. You already said there are synthetic fuels from solar and wind being discussed at the moment. At the moment, they are too cheap, uh, too expensive, of course. But this allows, of course, uh, also for some very interesting um, combinations. Um, for instance, I had a look at carbon capture solutions for ships. Of course, this is all being discussed for industrial plants, but maybe you can miniaturize that. And of course, then if you had synthetic fuels and carbon capture, you could even have a negative carbon ship, which is, of course, very interesting. But again, probably very expensive. But you asked me what is going to be the case in 2050. I would definitely have a look at carb, uh, synthetic fuels. And I think that's the easiest to handle and at the moment the most logical. Great, Nico. Thank you very much. And, and I think you also summarized very nicely. Uh, and also this was touched uh, by, by you, um, um, uh, Hen hey, Johan, that we, we are not only thinking about the fuel itself, it's also the price, the availability and the infrastructure. But one thing I just wanted to pick up on was you mentioned nu nuclear and the, and obviously, atomic power has uh, had some uh, attention in, in media lately, and um, we have read about it in trade winds and other, other maritime media. And I just wanted to sound with, with some of the other uh, panelists here. 
is this totally off or um, do you see any chance for any sort of atomic energy to enter deep sea shipping? I, I leave that open to anyone to, to sort of grab, please. So I'll make it short. Um, um, I guess just speaking for Germany, as this is the German panel, uh, the Germans are very scared about nuclear power. If a ship now would arrive in Hamburg port and the media would uh, write a nuclear powered ship has arrived, I think that would be the last port call in Hamburg. I think there are some other countries too who had their uh, experience with nuclear power not in the best ways. And in the end, you need a tram ship which can actually call every port uh, everywhere. So I think that it's quite problematic. All right. Okay. Let's um, let's um, move on. Um, uh, so we can say that um, on this pathway to decarbonization, uh, regulatory action is widely argued as being the biggest driving force. And um, beyond regulation, what do you see as the biggest incentives for switching to more sustainable and, and greener shipping? And if I could uh, go to you, Lucius, uh, for, for this one, please. Thank you. Thank you, Kude. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, certainly an interesting one to reply to. Um, I think when I look around on this panel, uh, what we certainly share is the conviction um, that uh, we don't need external incentives to understand the urgency of the matter. Um, and that uh, one of the key drivers is that we know that we need to act and that as an industry, um, we have to play our part to support the protection of the global ecosystem. Um, but when we're looking into uh, besides our own uh, inherent beliefs and the political uh, driven uh, regulatory activities. Uh, looking at the financial industry, for example, we will need to draw on capital going forward. Um, I happened to read the letter to CEOs by Larry Fink earlier this uh, week, BlackRock, uh, who spends paragraph after paragraph to remind uh, global business leaders that they should focus um, on addressing the climate change and um, put pen to paper, uh, look at uh, how same can be done going forward to reach the net zero uh, emission goals. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have to explain this on this panel, but BlackRock and other private equity uh, uh, and, and also the, you know, retail, everybody will ask the same questions going forward. And therefore, that certainly is a drive for us additionally. Um, uh, I also, looking at the debt side, I uh, had a discussion with a friend end of last week who's working in a commercial bank uh, in Germany, large commercial bank. Now, when they look at new projects and how to finance them, uh, the due diligence is no longer uh, limited to financial KPIs and market trends. And you know, they are also looking at the green footprint of uh, future projects. Poseidon principles uh, have been signed up to. Not everybody is acting according to them, but it's only a matter of time uh, when it becomes more and more important. Uh, so if we really want to um, continue to, to shape this industry, um, then we will have to address it, but we don't need to be reminded by external uh, incentive uh, I think, um, you know, some, some, everybody who has spoken up already has addressed it uh, in, with different questions. I mean, this is one of the major issues that is on our mind, uh, but it's only possible, I think, in a big collaborative effort. I mean, you, it's no chance that we can do it by ourselves. So we need to speak with the big oil majors. We have to have the collaboration of engine manufacturers. Um, I mean, it, we are operating the ships and we are there to support these efforts um, and spend money and uh, research and development. And uh, I mean, now, luckily that the markets are a bit better, you know, 12 years, uh, we were kind of trying to keep afloat. Uh, now there's a bit of a, um, a, a, a yeah, light at the end of the horizon with better rates, etc. We can pick up and, and, and 
push for the collaboration. And I think we will do this as an inherent belief in the need to actually support these activities. So to sum up, I think we will not be able to do it by ourselves, but collaborative action as such, open-mindedness to innovations and basically keeping keep talking about it. And then I love the optimism of Johan, <laughs> who is basically saying, you know, we will we will reach these goals. Uh, we will be better uh, than what uh, we are setting today. And even if people cannot grasp it by the imagination, I'm fully convinced and as optimistic as Johan is. Great input uh, and uh, an emphasis on on collaboration and innovation and uh, and uh, again back to to Vedra and and Unico. Any anything you would like to add, please? Um, I totally agree with uh, Lucius. Um, you asked for the biggest incentive. I guess nobody wants to be on the wrong side of history, so that's a big incentive. And I think there's no doubt about it um, in which direction we're running this. We have had the Paris Climate Accord, now the IMO. We even have a timetable now of how to work and go forward. Um, so there's no doubt in which direction the world is running. What keeps me up at night, though, uh, is a little bit different. It is uh, that the, this time frame we have actually now have is being debated in a lot of parliaments. Like Nico Bonnemann said before that, we took a baseline from 2008, and there are some people in the world who believe that it's not a very ambitious one. So I believe uh, one of the biggest things is that this time frame actually a timetable can still move. So being too easy on this topic is probably a big danger for any company. And you can already see it right now in the new building orders. Everybody is trying to get it right. We are presented with a lot of technologies. We don't know what the technology will be, which is the future. We don't know the cost curves. So today we have very little new building uh, numbers. And uh, this is, uh, for me at least, an indicator that the shipping world is really thinking about getting it right. Another interesting aspect, which stems from, um, of course, from the cost of this new technology is that maybe an uneven playing field might emerge meaning that some countries would like to be faster in decarbonization, others will not. And this will have serious impacts because just imagine you are a country far away from global markets like the USA or China or the EU. Let's take a very specific example, kiwis and apples from New Zealand, which are perishable. Um, I'm quite sure that some of these countries, uh, if prices go up and their products become uncompetitable, they will have a problem with this. So I can actually see a world where things are in different, moving in different speeds. And this will change the landscape, which we have now, which is quite equitable. And maybe the future doesn't look that, that equitable. And it can lead to something which we've already seen now is a new form of protectionism. And that's another thing that keeps me awake at night. Very good. And um, uh, the timetable moving, I think that is uh, one that is, um, you know, also very concerning for, for all of us, um, not knowing exactly, you know, how to deal with, with the timing issue. And the second one is, as you point out, the, you know, the, the patchwork of uh, regulations based on regional uh, incentives, which is also very concerning. Uh, and I, I'm sure we could, you know, debate this uh, topic um, almost for the next um, uh, half hour without any problem. But um, since I would like also to cover a few other items, I, I'd like us to, to move on a bit. So. Uh, Maybe I could um, try to get you engaged now, Christoph, and, and thank you for your patience and, and waiting, um, you know, for, for your turn to, to get involved in this discussion. But I would like to, to start with, um, uh, with the downturn of 2008. And we saw that after that, many banks lost their appetite for financial financing shipbuilding projects. And I was just wondering how difficult is it today for German ship owners to gain access to finance and, and why should banks and, and others invest in the German market? And would you have a go at that, please, Christoph? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Knut. Uh, and thanks for Nicolas for hosting uh, this conference. Um, 
uh, we at Borealis obviously are not uh, the, the traditional German ship owner, uh, but uh, I happen to be in Hamburg right now, enjoying the lockdown from here. We have a small office here as well. And obviously with a German background, you know, we're very close to the German maritime cluster and uh, certainly have followed very closely, obviously the, you know, the time since 2012, uh, as you, sorry, 2008, as you described, you know, since the financial crisis, what has happened here in Germany and uh, what has changed. Um, you know, why have the banks lost appetite in ship uh, financing shipping? You know, I think uh, obviously a clear answer is uh, it, it has been tremendous loss making. Um, some, some of the banks, and particularly the German banks, had to take some massive losses uh, throughout the last 12 years. And, um, you know, some of the larger banks have therefore decided that uh, ship finance is just not for them. Um, it uh, was also here, uh, uh, obviously, a situation that uh, the German uh, market was very different than many other markets, because here in Germany, you had most of the projects were financed on a project by project basis. So you had individual ships that then got into problems that no one was there to bail them out. And you had the misalignment also at that stage, very much apparent between, you know, who was really the owner of that vessel and who was the manager and the bank, etc. So the owner on paper was really the manager and the manager, however, had no interest to put money in, but the manager had all the interest to try to extend the life of the vessel. So his message to the bank was always, you know, keep calm and carry on, you know, don't do anything. The market will recover. Um, nobody obviously expected it's going to be, 12 years uh, for the container market, uh, obviously, which dominates Germany uh, on the shipping side to, to recover. And so those banks who, take, who took quick action in hindsight, obviously uh, did the right thing. But there was a big struggle here in Germany um, with, with obviously the, 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 you know, the, the lack of fresh, fresh equity being able to come in and also the misalignment um, uh, on, 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 on the decision makers uh, and, and the banks. Um, that as a result obviously has reduced the German ship finance community quite significantly. Um, I was able to listen a little bit to this morning to also uh, Captain Hartmann when he said that, uh, you know, the German banks finance about 160 billion of loans uh, at the beginning of the crisis it was over 50% of shipping debt in the world was coming from German banks. That has fundamentally changed significantly here. Uh, there are still a few active players in this market. Um, there's a few who have actually quite uh, quite a bit um, increased their, their book. And, and Berenberg Bank is obviously one to mention here, who has really been successful to, to expand it. But uh, coming back to, to, to the German structure and what, what is, makes it so difficult for German owners these days, and um, it's not necessarily that uh, you know, the majority, 80% of, of uh, shipping companies in Germany are very small companies. That's the same in Greece. But here in Germany, it's a lack of equity. It's, it's not necessarily just a lack of debt, but also it's just a lack of equity uh, that is, is um, uh, you know, hand handicapping the most of the shipping companies here to launch new projects to do shipbuilding. Um, shipbuilding obviously has some debt capacity, mostly from the from the Chinese leasing companies or the, you know, the Japanese uh, firms. So there is debt capacity for those who have equity and can can play some new buildings. But here in Germany, otherwise, the, the, the structure of the retail market in the past that was responsible for raising majority of the equity um, is, is today um, the issue, the, the problem why so few companies in Germany can actually launch new projects. You still have some big German owners left, Oldendorf, Schulte, etc., uh, who have the equity to also continue to being a substantial uh, owner in, in, in the future. Um, but it's a much shrinking cluster here. You have had some people who were able to uh, venture out and raise some uh, equity capital in a different way. Some have done it through pension funds. Uh, MPC obviously has done it through a through a through a listing. Uh, and uh, you know, but again, it's surprising that not more have been able in Germany to raise capital also from private equity or from other sources um, that than what maybe also weak owners have have been able to do. Um, Germany, however, still continues to be an attractive, uh, you know, maritime cluster. Uh, in general, I think it is apparent when you look around the world who are the largest uh, ship managers, you find a lot of 
German or German backed companies uh, that are um, uh, managers of vessels. And there is a tremendous expertise still uh, in, 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 in Hamburg, particularly uh, around ship management. There is a lot of high quality ships that are still controlled from here. And so for, for banks to continue to look at the German market as, as, as a market to lend into, obviously there is there is quality here, and hopefully that quality can be can be somehow also saved over the over the longer term, and uh, we can um, we can see you know the German or the maritime cluster surviving this um, this longer longer period of uh, of a downturn. Um, otherwise, um, we as a firm we have also launched a debt vehicle um, a while ago, Australis Maritime. It is uh, it is one of those uh, alternative lenders that is active right now out there. And uh, not necessarily unsurprisingly, uh, we have been very active in Germany. It's actually the German uh, book is actually our largest exposure right now. Uh, we have done uh, quite a number of projects here. Uh, and that is, again, a combination out of um, you know, our ability to, to provide higher leverage, which is, again, compensating for the lack of equity that, uh, that, that some projects here in Germany have. So uh, there is definitely room uh, or there is ability for alternative lenders to also make a, make a difference here in, in Germany and, and provide attractive, attractive capital. Great insights. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christoph. Um, uh, lack of equity but certainly no lack of quality and and competence um, to summarize maybe a little bit unfair but uh, in, in essence and uh, if i could turn to you nico uh, atlantic lloyd and then maybe uh, johan you can offer a comment uh, after um, what's your views um, nico please yeah um, i think Generally, of course, the, the times, uh, you know, when the German bank would call you and ask you when you would order a new building, uh, those are long over. And uh, the market has adopted, the owners have adopted. I think uh, what Christoph said is absolutely right. I mean, uh, the constraint is, is probably more the equity. Um, and once you have the equity, I think that that uh, comes in and you can actually choose depending on the structure you work in. And um, and there we see two very different models. The one is the project uh, business, non-recourse, um, where a lot of players have established. Uh, um, and, uh, and the other part is then, of course, the, uh, the recourse uh, lending against good credit. Um, and um, that market is, in my opinion, all very uh, active and healthy. Uh, there's enough banks to uh, to be willing to provide uh, um, loans, also even provide corporate lines such as hunting lines and all this. Um, but this is very few or almost, I, th I think, hardly to get in, in, in Germany. These would be then European banks or for us also Asian banks we work with. Um, and these are also then bigger loan tickets, uh, I would say $20 million plus. Um, and uh, so so I think the, the, the debt is there. Uh, it's just, uh, you have to work harder to get it and uh, and you have of, uh, you have to have the, the equity in place. And um, um, so I think there's no reason for a German owner to hide. It's just not uh, that you can find that money in need, but uh, you have to, to look abroad. Um, the as to the German uh, shipping cluster and the attractiveness, I think, uh, as Christoph said, uh, I think there is uh, still a lot of uh, expertise uh, here in our market, especially on technical and commercial management. Um, from a tax perspective, uh, the uh, tonnage tax uh, comes at a at a certain higher cost compared to many other international shipping centers, but still competitive in our point of view. So, uh, and we can also see uh, quite a few international ship managers now uh, teaming up with German owners uh, to set up business here. So from our point of view, um, uh, there is, uh, uh, especially on containers and also more recently, I think uh, bulk, uh, there is an, still a lot of, uh, knowledge and, um, and and that uh, should attract uh, uh, a strong cluster going forward. 
Thank you, Nico. Um, very optimistic and uh, I would say very inspiring uh, to hear that. And um, Johan, um, are you in agreement or, or would you, you know, have a different view on these things, please? I'm basically in agreement with what uh, Christoph said, a uh, little less optimistic maybe than, than uh, Nicolas. Um, so the question was, how difficult is it today for German ship owners? Uh, I mean, compared to the situation 15 years ago, it's a different world. Um, so it's much more difficult than then in two aspects. Um, back then we could, we could um, get the financing easily because um, the situation we all know, we all remember, <laughs> uh, half of the world um, shipping was uh, sh sh built, ships were financed by German bank, which was an absurd situation. And uh, the debt was, uh, the equity was also in place uh, due to the KG system. Um, both the uh, KG system is, is, is dead basically. Um, and uh, that makes it by itself more difficult to find, to, to get financing. And, and all these big German banks uh, were clustered here, um, are moved out of shipping. So it's much more difficult um, for German ship owners to gain access. I think if you have good projects, we, um, you, you know, I'm, I'm with Leonard and Bloomberg, um, we, we managed to, to get our uh, ships funded. We have to refinance a lot of ships over the last over the last years, and we found money with a lot of effort. We found money in Norway, in New York, in London, and also in Germany. But so we had to, be, to had to be much more active, and also put more equity in. But then we could find um, ship financing. So that's my my direct answer. To your question, I think the other part of the question we come to that number number seven. What does it mean for the German? I can still think a little bit about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, let's um, uh, let's move on uh, and now maybe have a, a bit of a focus on the pandemic. And um, if I can turn to you now, uh, Nico Oldendorf, on um, what lessons can the German shipping sector learn from the pandemic and, and what tactics did your company employ to overcome its uh, worst effects, please? Uh, thank you, Knut. Um, like you already said um, in the, your intro, uh, that this is probably the biggest humanitarian crisis we've seen so far in shipping, at least for the last 100 years. Um, what kind of strategies have we employed? Um, I must say uh, the strategy we have employed uh, was more or less our um, crew recruitment strategy my late father actually had made uh, implemented. And uh, he always said um, that flexibility is king. So um, I guess uh, compared to a lot of different shipping companies, we have a quite unique strategy, which we call the United Nations approach. We have, uh, just to give you some color there, we have, we're managing 55 ships at the moment. Those are more than 1,200 seafaring personnel, and they all come from more than 31 countries. So if you go on a Nord ship, you will have at least six uh, different nations. So this gave us a, a big and unique advantage over other companies, meaning um, our personal officers could actually develop more scenarios than if you have, for instance, a one nation ship and the country you're calling has just banned um, this nationality or even if the, let's say the flight plan to connect to this country is suspended at the moment. So how does the human resource department uh, look in a shipping company today? All the personal officers more or less are developing contingency plans all the time. It's a lot of micromanagement and sometimes uh, you have to have a plan B. So this United Nations approach caters to this. And we also applied another strategy, um, which is to use the diversity of your ship types, meaning if you have containers and bulk carriers. Uh, in our company, it is mandatory that um, officers and uh, uh, captains actually do both. So they are on a container ship, learn there. And before they become captain, they have to go on a container ship, uh, a bulk carrier. So you have this extra flexibility, which makes the situation a lot easier. And uh, the pandemic will shift again, um, I think, um, the idea that 
uh, you have to have a recruitment strategy in place which can cater to these uh, situations. There are also other benefits to um, this um, strategy, of course. Um, what we actually found out is that a lot of people um, who might actually be new to shipping and are cadets, they improve their English skills a lot faster um, if they cannot return to their mother tongue and speak uh, Tagalog or actually another language. So there are some very unique advantages of actually going the extra mile and employing more nations. And um, the other thing which is of course important is uh, this pandemic has uh, put a lot of workload on our personal officers and on our crew. Um, what we did to combat uh, frustration and stress is that we actually increased um, the entertainment budgets. Uh, people are now doing football matches in cargo holds if the safety allows it. There are a lot more barbecues. Um, connection to family has to be uh, improved. So. Uh, we have installed fleet broadband and uh, they are allowed to call us home as often as they would like. And uh, another, of course, very important uh, topic is um, we have now installed a, a competition, a cooking competition. Like it might sound quite trivial, but the quality of food on board a ship is uh, very substantial. Some people always joke after the captain and the chief engineer, the cook is the most important person. So this is what we have done and um, with our means at our disposal, I think uh, we're trying to manage the crisis. Excellent. Very good. Flexibility and, um, and a good chef uh, on board makes a lot of sense. Christoph, would you like to add anything um, to what you've heard so far, please? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, first of all, all of us will probably uh, mirror that uh, that opinion that uh, we all are surprised how well, more or less, the world has functioned uh, despite lockdowns, um, and how we have all been able to adopt quickly to the virtual world. Uh, I mean, this conference is a pediment of of that. Um, I think for, for for when I look at the last 12 months or 10 months or what it is right now, um, what has been key? I think communication is key. Communication uh, to your staff um, about what's happening. Um, uh, communication within the teams. Um, we you know started everyone started on video conferencing. Then you know we saw uh, by bits by bits cameras were switched off, etc. And then we said no, uh, please everyone camera on. And uh, we realize also that it makes a big difference uh, when the teams themselves, uh, you know, communicate with each other with the, with the camera on. Um, and uh, communication also to crew, you know, um, the crews were felt left behind, you know, they were somewhere out there in the ocean and seemed to be nobody was worrying about them and uh, sorry, you have to stay. And so it was also important uh, to communicate to, to, to the crew members that, you know, we are about we are we we are aware of what's happening in terms of you know contract uh, durations are, are much longer than intended, um, and and assuring them that that everything is 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 tried from the owner's side and from the manager's side to try to solve the issue, uh, to to reassure them. So that that's that was also one of the um, key things. And then um, we were invited from one of our private equity partners. We were invited to participate in a panel um, or in a, in, a, in, a, in a discussion where you know, various CEOs from all various different industries were voicing their, 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 how they were dealing with the, with the pandemic. And there was asked the question, what is your biggest concern about this lockdown? And uh, the, by far the biggest concern of CEOs from all different industries was loss of culture. Loss of culture, meaning, you know, that all these companies develop a certain culture in, in, in their organizations and by all working remotely, this is rather difficult to, to, uh, to retain. And again, it, came, it comes down then to communication and trying to, trying to make sure that your team retains the culture that you have set out as a company um, uh, to do. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, we for, for sure from our side have, have, have tried it. And um, so far, I think the, the feedback we're getting from our staff is that we have also succeeded. Um, but last but not least, I think, um, you know, as a container owner, we obviously certainly have enjoyed the shift from services to consumer goods and maybe you know the container owners are the least uh, least happy about an end of lockdown. Uh, you know we all have seen a big shift in consumer behavior, 
Uh, and uh, and again, um, surprising for all of us, I think, on, on, on the container market, how really the, the world's behavior uh, has, has changed. And, and so uh, it, while it started with a really difficult period and we all had a very difficult second quarter, you know, I think we all ended up uh, surprisingly healthy coming out of this crisis and, and hopefully, uh, you know, soon also in proper communication uh, with everyone again. Great insights. Thank you very much. Um, time is really flying uh, and I need to move on to... Um looking at the, the the future a bit and i would like to go to you first constantine and then maybe lucius you could uh, provide your views uh, as well uh, looking to the future what opportunities does the german shipping cluster need to capitalize on in order to stay competitive in the global market we, we barely touched this uh, a little bit earlier on but constantine please You are mute. I'm not on mute. Um, very good, very good. Thanks for the hint. Um, so just quickly, I, I would like to combine a few aspects that we have already addressed here. Uh, and, and this is a combination of the, the opportunity, which is obviously also a challenge being the, the energy transition as a, as a general uh, um, scheme. And, and secondly, and that was alluded to on, on various occasions before the access to funding being a necessity basically to capitalize on this opportunity. Um, and more specifically, at least in my book, I think the, the impending energy transition and related, related regulatory changes, but, but also other aspects constitute a, a key challenge, but an opportunity for the industry as a whole and, and therefore also for the German cluster. I have no doubt that the German engineering capabilities, technology and, and research and development will continue to be a very relevant force in global shipping going forward. And as such, the, the upcoming energy transition is an, is an obvious opportunity for the German maritime cluster. Having said that, um, we are on a ship owners panel here, of course, so I would like to focus a bit more on, on aspects that more relate to ownership and, and operations of, of vessels. So for German owners, it is vital to capitalize on existing know-how, expertise. I think some of that was already touched upon by earlier contributions. And, and at the same time, I think very important is access to funding. Uh, and there, I really share the view that, that Christoph has raised earlier. Um, it's about equity. Um, and, and really, Germany's prominent role in ship owning was built upon an almost unlimited availability of, of domestic funding, uh, combined with a favorable tonnage tax regime and, and other aspects. However, the area of, or the era of, of rather of, of passive shipping equity with low return requirements are certainly over. And uh, I think shipping is a global business and access to funding in particular equity is also an international and institutional scheme, um, at least when it comes to larger scale projects, not a project by project basis, I think funding will be available. Uh, but on a large scale and energy transition will confront us with large scale of funding requirements in particular equity. So this is really, really important. So having access to a variety of international institutional funding sources, public equity, private equity, bank finance, but also the US or the Nordic bond market, all kinds of, of, of areas is a key requirement for the German ship owning cluster to remain competitive and be able to move ahead in this highly capital intensive uh, ownership of vessels um, a scheme. So, so this is very important in my view. On the flip side, I fear that without the right corporate setup and necessary size, it would be very challenging for owners to capitalize on this exciting opportunity that is in front of us. So consolidation can help because size matters, um, but there are obviously also other aspects to consider. And I, with that, I would like to also allow Lucius to, 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 to give one more minute of, uh, of speech. Thank you, thank you, Constantine. I was just waiting that. for the right moment to jump in. Uh, thank you so much. Lucius, please, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Knut. Um, you mentioned earlier, world champion of global logistics. <laughs> I think that's quite a difficult one to live up to in the next 20 years. We need to really work hard on that. I would like to see uh, Hamburg to be a maritime cluster, not just in the face of raising equity debt, but also in terms of innovation. I think we really need to collaborate on helping startups uh, to uh, push the digital um, change. Uh, and that will also help to meet our decarbonization goals. I think there's some promising 
uh, developments already, but I think as a, a cluster uh, in the maritime industry, we'll have to work together. And uh, maybe to address as a final remark, uh, one of the questions that was raised, uh, the elephant in the room, diversification. Um, I think it does, we will have to work hard to address the best minds to actually draw them into our industry uh, to get female attention and to try to get uh, more diversification. Um, you know, this is, was one of the critical remarks that was uh, addressed prior this uh, conference that it's 100% uh, male. Um, but in general, I, you know, I feel we are in a good position um, uh, to draw young uh, uh, talent uh, and to actually put focus on innovation uh, as a cluster. Uh, so that just as an additional remark. Thank you so much. And, uh, and gentlemen, I would just like to thank you so much for taking part and contributing and sharing your insights and wisdom on this. And, uh, and Nicholas, I think we could have gone on for at least another half hour if you would have allowed us, but we understand there's a, a tight program. And uh, again, a very, uh, very warm thank you to the panelists and uh, also to all the people that have been listening in and uh, I really appreciative that you took the time and effort every one of you to take part in this uh, very important and, and good discussion and I hand it back to you Niklas thank you so much well thank you again it's been a tremendous panel uh, uh, a lot of collective wisdom and uh, expertise on this panel so thank you so much uh, we got great attendance and uh, we are going to make the uh, the replays available right away. So um, we'll make sure that people from all over the world have, have a chance to uh, access your uh, insight and wisdom. Thank you to everybody again, very much. All right, thank you very much. I'm sorry we missed out on the last question, but time just flew uh, away. So anyway, thank you so much. Great to be with you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, thanks.